Hello everyone, welcome back. It's another video lecture for business ethics. Um, this is our kind of part two to whistleblowing. Um, so on Tuesday we talked about the Davis piece. You got to see the standard model um, from Davis and then a bit of a criticism uh, from Davis about um, how to approach understanding the moral contours of whistleblowing. Um, and tonight we're going to have two more um, entries into that discussion from Duska and Larmer. And there's a couple things I wanted to kind of talk about as, as a, kind of a framing thing uh, before we get started with this. Um, the first one is that um, a lot of the topics in the curriculum for this quarter uh, are controversial things where you're kind of getting one side and then another side. So like that there's some like direct uh, conflict or disagreement, rational disagreement, rational controversy um, from that disagreement. Like, for example, next week we're going to be doing affirmative action. And we've got two readings for that. One from Henger, one from this guy named Pogeman. And they are going to clash, like, directly with each other. And um, and that happened with um, Hosnas, Boatwright, Friedman. I mean, they're in direct disagreement with each other, too. So this week is a, just a little different. I mean, you see Larmer disagreeing with Duska. So he kind of goes after Duska by name, right? He's like, Duska wrote this paper on loyalty, and I think he's wrong, and here's why kind of thing. So there's a little bit of tension there. Um, but I would say this this week is a little a little different in just that it's not so much about direct antagonism. Um, as I was exploring this with my other class earlier today, um, they are sort of remarking about how a lot of the points that are being ma made by these various philosophers could maybe be combined. They're not necessarily stepping on each other's toes here. Um, so, for example, Davis is um, arguing for this complicity model, right? Uh, com uh, that the the moral basis for why you got to blow the whistle, and he is talking about obligatory whistleblowing, um, is because of this uh, demand to uh, moral demand to not personally be involved in serious wrongdoing and if to, to do that is wrong right and that's why you gotta blow the whistle so it doesn't really have anything to do with anybody else and that's interesting because um, it doesn't matter what else is happening at the company I mean there's gotta be some serious wrongdoing going on but it's just your participation in it is the reason why Davis thinks you gotta blow the whistle or the the risk of your participation in it is why uh, you gotta blow the whistle um, so when, you know, to let a little of the cat out of the bag here for Duska, when Duska wants to investigate this claim about loyalty to the company, and his thesis is going to be that companies are not proper objects of loyalty, I mean, that could, and Davis sort of accepts the standard model that accepts this kind of premise that companies do, all other things being equal, kind of deserve loyalty from employees, but Davis doesn't probably have to do that. Like, if... Davis looks at Duska's argument and says, okay, maybe you're right, Duska. Maybe um, companies aren't proper objects of loyalty. Um, I think the rest of Davis's picture could still survive that. It's not going to be threatened by that. And in some interesting ways, I think we'll see by the end of tonight, even the stuff that Larmer is throwing down that's supposed to be in like direct competition with Duska's reading of the loyalty situation might also be combined. So part of being a student of philosophy is recognizing where there is conflict. Um, I was just saying to Theo right before we got started, like philosophers, I was saying that thing again, I think I mentioned to everybody about how philosophers go looking for trouble. They're looking for disagreement, for opportunities of disagreement. Not because they want to like engage in flame wars all the time or something. They're not, they're not troublemakers in that sense, um, but because they want to uh, dig into these issues more deeply. And being able to detect where there is actual disagreement, where it may not look like there's disagreement, is definitely an important skill being a student of philosophy as you're exploring these disagreements and issues and theories that people have that may be similar in some respects and different in other respects. Like, where where is this idea going to step on this idea's toes? That's, that's one of the questions. Um, but uh, there's also a skill in being able to detect when ideas are not necessarily in conflict with each other. They might look like they're in conflict or they're saying different things or putting the emphasis on different things, but there also might these, be these points where you can be like, ooh, that's a great insight right there. I'm going to take that insight and find a way to fit it in with this other insight I got from this other place to kind of like weave them together or to integrate them 
or to figure out, oh, that's a good point, and this is a good point, and they might conflict, but is there some other way in which they could be synthesized together, that they could be brought together without contradiction? I'm sorry, my phone is blowing up here because uh, I, there's some stuff going on on campus today, so I think I've had a lot of students just now kind of figuring out about what happened and contacting me, so my apologies for all the beeps. I'm going to actually mute my... Um, speakers right now. If you want to use the microphone, send a little thing in the message board to let me know you're going to do that. Otherwise, I won't hear you because I'm going to mute my speakers now. Um, okay. Everyone can still hear me, right? I didn't accidentally mute the microphone. Okay, cool. All right. So I think that that's kind of happening. That's a little relevant for... Um, this uh, topic this week with whistleblowing, that all these different papers are adding little insights into there, and maybe some of them could be combined. Um, if you liked one of them and then you liked another one, then maybe maybe there that isn't a contradiction, right? That can happen. And the other thing that I really like about these readings, especially the Duska reading, is that even if, if we don't have these like straight competitors, what Duska's doing is really taking a framing of an issue and rethinking the assumptions that are behind it. And I actually went on quite a long tangent in my other class this morning, uh, or this af earlier afternoon, um, talking about how uh, in doing like philosophical critical reflection, it's not always just about the substance of the arguments that someone is making to defend a particular position on an issue. It might also be the uh, place that people can be open to criticism or something that ends up shaping or informing a perspective is how you understand what the problem is, how you frame it up. And as we saw from uh, Davis, the standard way that mo many business ethicists have approached the whistleblowing question is that it's a problem because blowing the whistle is an act of disloyalty. That normally, under most conditions, uh, the company deserves employee loyalty, um, which is to say that the employees need to be committed to the good of the company for its own sake. That That's a kind of, I had some students earlier who were like, what do we mean by loyalty? They're throwing loyalty around a lot. What do we mean by that? That's my proposed definition. If you're loyal to something, then you're committed to it being in a good state uh, for its own sake. That um, you could you could care about something without caring about it for its own sake, like as a means for something else. Like I might care about the company as a means for me getting my paycheck or something like that, right? But loyalty is like you're looking out for the best interests of the company, for its own sake, not in any way in which it's going to reflect back to you or for some other project, but just the business itself. So when a employee blows the whistle on the company, that might threaten the company's interests. And so it might be seen as an act of disloyalty. But we think, oh, but there's all this moral reason to blow the whistle, either from the standard model's uh, attention on uh, the risk of harm, or in Davis's revised version, this concern about moral com uh, uh, complicity and wrongdoing, right? So um, that sets it off, and then it's like, OK, well, under what conditions then does the standing concern about loyalty get overwhelmed or overcome by other moral considerations where it's like, okay, yeah, you probably need to do the disloyal thing. That's how it's standardly framed. And, and Davis still continues with that, although, like I mentioned, I don't think he necessarily has to. But Duska is basically trying to rethink the whole framing of that debate and be like, can we really accept that premise? Do companies deserve your loyalty? Are they proper objects of loyalty? That's the question that, that Duska is going to be getting into. And he, his argument, he's, he's going to argue for the position that they don't, that they are not proper objects of loyalty and they don't deserve the loyalty of the employees. And uh, I always have some students that are just like, what, 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 what? Like, how is that supposed to make sense? But we'll, we'll take a look at the arguments and see what you think of them. Uh, people in the chat, as always, please feel free to jump in with your comments, reactions, questions. Uh, request for clarification, all that good stuff. You, you're you very much valued and uh, you add to the value of this for everybody else too. I'm just going to say that every video. <laughs> I know you've heard me say it before. Um, one other preliminary here before we get into how Dusk is going to try to accomplish all this. Um, anytime you see philosophers using some phrase in Latin, it usually means something uh, like that 
uh, well, of course it means something, but it means something special. That it's like a, some kind of technical term of art that has a very precise like definition and that kind of thing. And I want to explain this word uh, prima facie. Um, so to say that something is a prima facie concern, like in the context here we're saying employees have a prima facie duty to uh, be loyal to their employer. Okay, so under under normal circumstances, all other things being equal, you ought to be loyal to the company. To to say it's a prima facie duty is to say it's a apparent duty. Um, that it's like one card that's being thrown down on the table in the debate, um, but it could be overwhelmed by other considerations. So it's not an absolute duty. It's a contingent duty. It's saying. Um, if there isn't any other moral issue that's a bigger deal, then this is the thing you ought to do. And actually, um, I'm getting really, this is one I wish I had my whiteboard, but I can grab one. I'll be right back here. This is my kid's whiteboard here but it'll work for our purposes tonight. Um, so imagine uh, prima facie considerations happen in every debate. They're, they're all over the place. So this is a common term that you might see in other places, and I might even show up a few more times in the rest of uh, our readings this quarter. But let's say you got two positions. Oh, what's going on? The marker dried up? Yeah, there's some stuff on the board. Oh, it's a little wet. Okay, here. Let's, does it work now? There we go. Well, sort of. Good enough. Okay. <laughs> so you got two positions here, you know, option A and option B, and there's a couple lines, right? And as we start looking at arguments or, or factors, considerations, issues of moral sensitivity, morally relevant features, any of the kind of stuff that people want to make moral arguments about, that might be like there's a prima facie problem with one position, or a positive prima facie duty to do something else, right? So imagine this is like uh, support for a position, right? Like this one's getting some more support, or this one's losing support, and so that's a reason not to do it kind of thing. If it's a prima facie duty or prima facie concern, then that's not the end of the story necessarily. There, as we start dropping more cards on the table, as we do more reflective analysis and look at other features or other facets or other concerns, it might be that there's so much going for B that even if it's got this little prima facie concern, you know, it still is the thing to be done. And that's this is how the standard model kind of sets up the whistleblowing controversy. Oh yeah, it's disloyal, but we got to prevent all this harm that's going on. Or under um, Davis's model, yeah, it's disloyal, but you've got an obligation to not be involved in serious moral wrongdoing that definitely outweighs that duty. And we talk about competing duties all the time. Um, this was something I talked about in the Hosnos piece, about how Hosnos was playing a little fast and loose with ideas of deontic obligations or duties. Is that it's very common that we have a duty in one place, an obligation or a moral commitment to one party or one issue, and then over here we got another one, and it's different, and they can't have it both ways. You're between a rock and a hard place. You might have experienced this before. It sucks. <laughs> Maybe there's no good options, but you're still going to have to decide, you know, which obligation or duty am I going to violate to promote the other. There may not be a happy solution where I'm able to respect all of them. I may have to choose, and how am I going to choose? That's what you need ethical theories for, to help you sort that out, to deal with those conflicting values. Think back to utilitarianism. Mill wanted a nice theory, uh, an elegant theory that could resolve all the different disagreements that we have. And if you, I mean, w whether you think it's ultimately correct or not, um, there's no denying that the principle of utility pretty much deals with every single possible conflict of moral values that you could have. Uh, it, like theoretically, it's able to, it has the power to do that. You just look at the options and pick the one that creates the most utility. Boom, there you go. Um, so that's what theories are supposed to do. They're supposed to resolve those kinds of disagreements. But this idea that just because something is a duty doesn't mean it's the thing you have to do is a pretty important idea. 
There are other duties, though, that are not prima facie duties. Like, for instance, when Kant's talking about the duty to follow the categorical imperative. That's a categorical duty, not a hypothetical one with contingency to it. A prima facie duty is one that definitely has contingent authority. Um, it could be outweighed in, in, by other considerations. Um, but something like the categorical imperative is like, no, you have to do that all the time, no matter what. There's no times in which something else could outweigh uh, the, the duties that you have from the categorical imperative, at least according to what Kant is, how Kant is advancing uh, those, those, that moral law. It's an absolute rule. Okay, so that's the idea of prima facie. There, there is a little, I could get a little more hair splitty about this. Um, the definition I've been giving you is basically the one that uh, would correspond to how most philosophers use it. But in Latin, prima facie just means like, uh, in an equivalent idiomatic term today, something like at first blush. Like, this is how things seem to be. This is how they appear to be. But um, technically speaking, prima facie considerations are ones that may actually evaporate entirely under analysis. Like as we have more of the debate and have more of the conversation and look at that concern, it might be that we're like, oh, this looked like it mattered, but now that we're thinking about it, it doesn't actually matter at all. Whereas we have another term in law <clears throat> called pro tanto. And pro tanto means, I, I think, is a closer fit and just linguistically to the phenomenon I was describing as prima facie. That basically this is a thing that matters, it just may not matter the, as the most important thing. There could be other considerations that outweigh it. Most of the time when philosophers talk about a prima facie duty, they're saying even if it gets overridden, it's still morally relevant. Like in the instance of the standard approach to whistleblowing. Loyalty matters all the time, it's just there's something else that might matter more. So it cuts against it, but it still counts, you know, it's still, it's not like it has evaporated from its moral relevance just because we're not going to go there. Very similarly, to use utilitarianism again, even if you don't do the action that promotes a person's utility because of maximizing more utility in another way, that person's um, disutility still counts. I mean, the fact that they didn't get their positive utility is something that is still morally relevant. That's why utilitarianism isn't writing some people off as not mattering or something, even if it's not taking courses of action that give those people what they want, right? So um, let me know, chat, how is this, make, is this making sense? Feeling good? Any questions about prima facie duties? Looked like I think I saw Walter's name. You had maybe something, and then maybe you deleted it. Um, I get to see the for those of you watching this on YouTube on the Skype chat. I can see when people are typing messages, like on text programs. Uh, so sometimes I'm waiting for that. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so it sounds like we're good on that. If you got any questions about the definition of this, please let me know. Um, but again, the the setup here is that. Under the standard model, before we ever get to Davis or Duska or Larmer or anybody else here, the usual way that, that business ethicists have looked at the question of whistleblowing is that there's a, a prima facie duty of loyalty to the company and that the employee, when they blow the whistle, that would normally be a violation or a betrayal of trust. It would be a violation of that loyalty and would be wrong. But when whistleblowing is permissible or obligatory, the circumstances are not equal. There's some other factor here, basically the wrongdoing of the company, the risk of harm, all that kind of stuff. Those other moral considerations override or overwhelm whatever moral force there is in uh, the, the loyalty to the company. And so um, you're supposed to blow the whistle in those cases. But we're like, it's the lesser of two evils <laughs> to blow the whistle. That's the standard way it's set up. What Duska wants to do is say, whoa, 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 hold the phone. 
why is there even a problem here at all? Dusk is going to argue, because companies are not proper objects of loyalty, there aren't even prima facie concerns with whistleblowing. There's, there's nothing that should be blocking it. No one should, no employee, Duska thinks, should ever be worried about blowing the whistle, other than that if it's like unjustified accusation or something like this, or it's not a serious harm. I mean, he's fine with that, those kinds of things. But he's like, you shouldn't be staying up at night being like, oh, should I be disloyal to the company? He's like, no, you don't have any loyalty to the company. If they're engaged in wrongdoing, that's on them. Like, you don't have to somehow protect the company. Um, you, that's not your obligation or duty. And if you see yourself in that way, Duska's actually like, that's wrong. 99% of the time, that that's a mistake. You shouldn't be doing that. Now, Duska's argument, so that's his position. And that's how it's going to connect with the wider debate around, around whistleblowing, is Duska's basically undercutting that there's even a real serious ethical problem here to begin with about whistleblowing as a violation of loyalty. And I could sum up Duska's plan for defending this thesis into actually a very simplified argument that just has two premises. Um, the, the devil's going to be in the details a little bit here, but in the broad strokes, it's a pretty straightforward argument. Duska's going to argue first for a standard of loyalty, a, some, a criteria for what it takes in order for something to be a proper object of loyalty. In other words, he's going to be arguing for a measuring stick, something we can use to, this is the standard for like proper objects of loyalty. And then the second premise is he compares that standard uh, against what's happening with the businesses and saying, uh, well, what, what's happening with businesses here doesn't meet that standard. Therefore, businesses are not proper objects of loyalty. It's that straightforward. He's like, here's my standard. Here's businesses. Square them up. Nope, they don't fit. They don't fit the bill. They don't meet the conditions that are needed in order for something to be a proper object of loyalty. So there you go. Now you don't have to worry about whistleblowing on your company. <laughs> I mean, you should be worrying about other things there, but... Um, th the loyalty thing is not going to be the factor that's a deal maker, deal breaker for whistleblowing. So it shouldn't be even something that trips you up or slows you down with whistleblowing at all. Okay. And along the way here, I mean, Duska's paper, I, I actually like this one. I, I told you I don't always um, put papers in that I like, but I'm picking for uh, the curriculum on, on other sorts of merits. Um, but it so happens I'm I'm kind of partial to uh, Duska's arguments here, and part of it is that it's not just a matter of business ethics, but I think Duska's uh, shining a spotlight on some pretty interesting um, things about the nature of loyalty itself. And I think Larmer's kind of interesting for that reason, too. Uh, this, these papers might actually have application not just for you in the business world or your, your own business career or something like that, but also just maybe for life in general. Um, there's some cool stuff here. Uh, as an ethicist myself, um, I'm not going to talk too much about my ethics in this class, or unless you want me to, or you want to talk to me outside of class. But um, I'm very, um, I'm very focused on relational spaces in my understanding of ethics, just in general. So in my own philosophical work, that's a, that's kind of a big deal for me. Um, so I like how much uh, attention that Duska is putting on that space. And he's got some very interesting things about how we ought to think about that space and, and understand its contours morally. So I think there's some other cool things to get out of this paper, too. But let's begin at the beginning here. Um, if you're in the chat tonight, uh, I do always recommend pulling up the lecture notes. Um, so I'm going to be pulling those on, up on the screen for the YouTube people um, so they can kind of follow along here, too. Um, and actually, I figured out a way to get my... Yeah, there's a webcam in the corner. Cool. And, um, oh, shoot, if I do this, then I can't see if anyone makes a comment. Um, oh, I'll, I'll turn on my speakers again, and then it'll probably beep at me. Okay, well, actually, um, someone in chat just send a, a, a silly, stupid message just so I see if I hear a beep. Yeah, there's a beep. Okay, thank you. What did you say? Test. Oh, okay, cool. That might be super goofy. All right. Um, so where we're going to start in approaching this, so the basic argument is that simple. Here's a standard for loyalty. Companies are here. They don't meet the standard. They're not proper objects of loyalty. 
But before we get into um, Duska's really specific um, criteria, his theory of pro of something being a proper object of loyalty, um, you can you can think about this a lot, like the way Davis broke down the standard model and the complicity theory model, that there's like a set of conditions. Duska doesn't give us a really explicit list of conditions, but he does, and I kind of wish he did. I, I think he could be a little bit more explicit about some of this stuff. But he does definitely throw some cards down that are suggestive, that kind of outline what a, a more pinned down theory of loyalty or proper objects of loyalty would look like. But before we even get to the details of that, of like what are the factors here. Um, Duska first does this little exploration of what loyalty just is. Like what could it look like? What could be an object of loyalty? Um, how could we understand that? And he's going to look at three options and reject two of them in favor of the third. Now in some ways the arguments in this section, even if they fail, uh, I think Duska might still have most of his theory intact. Um, it may not be a, a fatal wound. Um, I kind of am personally not very compelled. Uh, I don't find his arguments compelling about uh, his, uh, his rejection of idealism. Um, I think he might be guilty of a straw man here, and I've got some other concerns. But um, I don't think that that's going to necessarily threaten um, his core argument. However, uh, I want to cover this stuff because it's interesting for understanding uh, the loyalty phenomenon itself. And again... Um, one thing that's probably worth mentioning, I didn't mention this in my other class, and then about halfway through the, the lecture, I was like, oh, I should, have, I should have said that. I shouldn't have skipped over it. But right here at the beginning, in my lecture notes, I say, note that this debate is a matter of what it is appropriate to be loyal to, not what we could be loyal to. So there are plenty of opportunities for people to have loyalty. But we might think, oh, there's a bunch of these cases that we would maybe describe as misplaced loyalty. And that is, uh, so this debate is really about what we ought to do. I do think that um, it's true that at this point in the 21st century in America, the corporate culture is very much one of loyalty. And I actually thought when I was a college student myself that this might be changing a little bit, that there might actually be some movement away from that. A lot of people in my generation seem to be like, yeah, I'm not going to see the meaning of my life in my career for a company, like working for a business. Um, <clears throat> I've got all these other things that are the things that are really meaningful to me in life, especially relationships with people. Um, but as I've gotten older and seen my generation get older, it seems like it's actually gone the other direction, where now <clears throat> people are looking for their relationships and their community in the business world and bringing in the kinds of values that would be a part of, say, a meaningful human relationship, like loyalty, into the context of your business relationships. Um, so I do think that I've had so many friends working, especially in the tech industry, um, that report on this kind of thing, that like, the, uh, and, and nonprofit sector, don't get me started on that. Um, but the companies are expecting them to really devote themselves to the success of the company and that there are these like interwoven relationships here uh, and then if someone's not doing that if they don't exhibit that kind of loyalty that they're somehow not a good employee that they're lazy that they ha lack virtue um, all this kind of stuff um, so the pressure to be loyal to your company to exhibit loyalty I think is pretty high today in, in a lot of different sectors of the business world. Um, even when there's at the same time this kind of like understanding of the business world as some kind of like cutthroat jungle ball kind of thing, it's really funny to me that both of those things can happen at the same time. Um, and maybe Desk is going to have some useful insights for how we can understand that in his analysis of, the, of loyalty itself. Um, <clears throat> but that, that's the question. I mean, plenty of people can be loyal to a company. It's not like it's impossible to do that. It's just, is that a good idea? <laughs> is that proper? Is it appropriate to do so? Um, is this misplaced loyalty or not? And Duska thinks, his thesis is, it is misplaced. Loyalty to the company is misplaced. Okay, so uh, getting into these three different forms of loyalty, or what you could be loyal to. <clears throat> Sorry, pardon me.
there's idealism, social atomism, and this moderate view. And Deska wants to defend the moderate view. If you read the paper, you, you kind of know where this is going. Um, but uh, I think idealism is pretty tricky to understand. Um, social atomism and the distinction between social atomism and moderate and the moderate view, I've had some students report to me is a little tricky to understand as well. Um, but I, I find that we spend most of our time talking about idealism. Um, so let, let's knock that one out first. And, and we'll also at the same time, I'm going to kind of skip ahead in the lecture notes here. We'll, we'll talk about what idealism is as a theory of loyalty and then also Deska's problems with it. So the idea here with idealism is that what you're loyal to is an abstract entity. It's a, um, a kind of cause or a value or a vision, um, a purpose, something like this. It's not a person. It's not people. It's not like you're loyal to specific people. And it's also not loyalty to a convention or even an institution. Like um, <clears throat> having loyalty to the business doesn't really fit with idealism so much. Um, th it is possible that um, loyalty to an ideal might, uh, or to like an ideology, um, might make you loyal to an institution, but only contingently. So if we were saying, if we're using my definition from earlier, that loyalty is a commitment to something that it exists in a good state for its own sake, then if my concern for my employer is really just with how that employer gives me opportunity to engage in some kind of higher ideal or higher purpose, then it really isn't valued for its own sake. It's just being valued as a means for making that happen. And honestly, I think I kind of fit the bill here. I think I could use myself as an example um, with my loyalty to Bellevue College, which I, I don't know, it's weird. I don't know exactly how I feel about it, but I definitely, I, I reflect and find feelings of loyalty to Bellevue College, whether it's proper or not, I sometimes wonder. But what I'm, what I'm really loyal to is not the college. What I'm loyal to, what I have loyalty for, is a kind of vision, the mission statement of the college. That is something I could have loyalty to. And in fact, uh, when I was talking about this with the other class this afternoon, we kind of were exploring it a little bit more. People were asking some questions about it. And um, is, is there some noise going on in the background? Are you, are you guys hearing some noise in the background? Sorry to interrupt. Any distracting noise happening? Not really. Very faint. Yeah, the washing machine got turned on. I was trying to decide. It was kind of distracting me, so I was like, maybe it's distracting you too. Um, but it's not. It's not that bad. Okay. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll stop freaking out about it. Okay. Um, I can get over it. So I'm saying. Um, uh, we, we were talking this afternoon, and, and I brought up this thing that happened a couple years ago um, with our last president, where there was some talk that Bellevue College was going to merge with Western. And uh, I was really opposed to that. And I, I sent a letter in, you know, they were asking for feedback and stuff like that. And I was like, no, I'm not down with this. And the reason is that Western has a very different mission statement than Bellevue College. And in particular, one of the things that I'm loyal to is the, the this vision or ideal of um, making quality education available to people for whom it's not as accessible. Um, yeah, 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 WSU. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, Washington State University. Sorry, not Western. Yes. Thank you, Leticia. Um, that uh, um, Bellevue College is committed to making education more accessible to people. And WSU has this like massive emphasis on research. And you go looking at their mission statement, you go looking at all the documentation about their institution, that's not a priority for them. And I was like, I'm interest I have loyalty to Bellevue College based on my loyalty to that value. And you can definitely imagine how so I'm I'm an idealist in the sense I'm loyal to this kind of purpose, to this um, moral ideal or ambition or vision or principle, that kind of thing, an abstract entity, like a, a moral concern. Um, if Bellevue College no longer operated in a way that was consistent with that vision, 
then all of my loyalty to Bellevue College would evaporate in a heartbeat. And sometimes I have some questions about that. I don't, I don't think that Bellevue College is fulfilling its mission mandates as well as it could be. And sometimes uh, it's been somewhat bad about that. Um, but I still, I'm like, well, the fact that it still is the mission statement and there are people here that are working toward that um, means I'm still, you know, committed to this institution thriving. I want to invest in it. I want to go the extra mile with what I'm doing um, to promote Bellevue College, uh, to make it a successful institution because it accomplishes this other thing this higher ambition or higher ideal and that's the thing that I really have loyalty to Bellevue College is just an instrument it's just a mechanism it's a means for accomplishing that end it doesn't exist as an end in itself okay um, so that that'd be an example of loyalty to an idealism or um, Duska brings up religion and I think in many times it can work that way for religion too um, and even in the same sort of way in which the institution is not the real thing like, um, I, I think uh, someone who is religious doesn't care so much about the human institution, like if you've got some legally registered church or temple or something like that, mosque, whatever it is, um, that the U.S. government recognizes as an organization. That's not the thing you really have the loyalty to. It's to the religious vision, the theology, the doctrine, the values, um, all of that that's the thing that you're really loyal to and um, so that that would be another example of of um, idealism the other um, factor here uh, the other example that came up in class earlier today that I thought was really useful uh, for helping students understand it so I'm just kinda giving you a big laundry list here of examples but I'm hoping that they're illustrative uh, let me know if they aren't working for you or you got questions about them but um, the last one I wanted to offer you was uh, Edward Snowden uh, who is a whistleblower and um, then he had to skip the country because the government wanted to prosecute him for revealing state secrets and, and, and confidential information and stuff like that. Now what's interesting here is that um, even though the accusation against Snowden and I'm not, I'm not here to debate whether what he did was right or wrong or how we're going to evaluate his whistleblowing I just want to think about what is Snowden loyal to and the accusation that he got immediately and ongoing is that he betrayed his country. He is disloyal, right? Uh, he, he engaged in treasonous activity against the United States. And if you hear Snowden talk about it, he thinks he's a patriot. And that's interesting. What's going on there? Well, what he betrayed is institutional parameters. Right? And, and those institutional parameters don't just exist for their own sake. There's moral reasons why those rules are in place and all that kind of stuff. Like I said, I, I don't want to debate whether what Snowden did was right or wrong here. But there's a difference between betraying or not being loyal to the institution or the set of rules or laws and um, loyalty to an ideal. And the United States, America, is not just the institutional government but also maybe a kind of vision, right? A set of values, a way of understanding society and justice um, that maybe you could be loyal to that. So you're like, U.S. government, as long as you're doing those things, as long as you are a vehicle for that vision happening, then I got loyalty to you. And as soon as you stop doing that, then I don't. That's what John Locke thought with civil disobedience. He's like, as long as the government is a just government, it deserves my respect. And as soon as it stops being just, I don't respect it anymore. That my loyalty to it is contingent on it upholding justice. And that's how Snowden felt. He felt that the United States was acting un-American. It was betraying the values and principles um, that is the vision of the form of government that we created in the Constitution and all that kind of stuff. Um, so when the government was not doing what it was supposed to, then he's like, it, the loyalty I've got is to these values, to these ideals. And I, I think about this as, uh, I'm sorry to go on a little tangent here about this, but um, especially in the context of something like patriotism or religious faith, I mean, these things can get um, distorted so quickly. And I think it's interesting um, how 
to be at all interested or to like you you might think America is just totally crap like even on paper you know even in the vision of it like the Constitution stuff like Declaration of Independence it's just that's all BS you might you might think that I mean, we could argue about that uh, is the vision of social justice that's present there um, a, a good one an ideal one or you know what are its problems it, it, which one what are the problems that it has that kind of thing but there's a big difference between um, criticizing that and criticizing uh, the way that America actually is because how America is isn't necessarily defining of what America is if that makes sense in other words the institutions may not be reflective of the vision and I think that has always happened uh, my my opinion is that America has never actually existed in accordance with the vision in its formation that's something that we've had to work for and fight for internally not just with external threats but how much are we actually going to have a country that reflects those values and it, it might be that you feel torn about your loyalty to the country based on maybe loyalty to that ideal <clears throat> but not necessarily to the execution on it right that you got the criticism for that more on that kind of idea when we get to Larmer because I think Larmer's got a really interesting card to play when it comes to that sort of arena but if you if any of you out there are like feeling torn when you think about the this country and <clears throat> whether you would ever say that you're patriotic or that you have loyalty to it I think uh, Deska's analysis here is just really interesting in the sense of like there's a lot of different things we might be loyal to lo loyal to here and we shouldn't be confusing them they're definitely different types of things and so this first theory is just about how you could be committed to this kind of idea or concept or ideology or something like that and not necessarily to people or to conventions um, so not to laws which are just specific conventions um, or maybe customers which would just be certain types of people or something like that okay um, so uh, people in chat let me know is this making sense just what what form of loyalty we're talking about when we're talking about the idealism model Nothing. Thank you. Thank you for telling me, Theo. <laughs> Just gonna give it a second here. Okay. Cool. It's such a change of pace for me. My afternoon class is like we always barely get through everything we need to get through because people are asking questions and stuff all the time. So uh, in our class, it's different, and I'm not saying it's necessarily bad or something like that, but um, I just have to switch gears in my head. Um, if you do, I mean, if people do have tangents or things they want to explore in terms of the lay of the land here, I mean, you are definitely free to do this. Um, if it's going off on too many tangents, it's my job to manage that kind of thing and, and have efficient use of time here. Um, <clears throat> but I, I think it's, it's great to explore and play around with ideas and be like, well, what about this sort of thing and that sort of thing and stuff like that. <clears throat> okay. Looks like Walter's got something. Um, tries to offer an opportunity for clarity to reflect where you're putting your loyalty to. Yes, yeah. Um, an idea that um, I'm going to probably bring up here right at the end of the Duska lecture before we get into Larmer is how loyalty to one thing <clears throat> can bleed into loyalty for something else and loyalty for one thing might be that might be a proper object of loyalty but on the basis of loyalty to that thing it might bleed over into other things that are not proper objects of loyalty that can very much happen so I think a lot of times people do confuse things like 
the ideals of egalitarianism, liberty, um, government by the people, all that kind of stuff with like the American that that's going on with American government with the actual government, like the actual people that are in it, or the particular conventions or rules of law that are involved in it. Instead of saying, "Whoa, those things could come apart," right? You could be loyal to one and not to the other. Um, so I do think that that's useful, uh, and that's that's part of why we do this theoretical analysis. Um, when philosophers want to split hairs, sometimes it's because the two sides of the hair that are split really should be kept separate from each other, or there, there's you know there's controversy about whether they should be intertwined or not. Um, like I said in the, my examples, or as came out in the illustrations, sometimes loyalty to one thing does properly extend to loyalty to another. But if you remember, like, what's the thing that it's really all about? Uh, as Mill talked about, remember when we did um, Mill's arguments against virtue? He was talking about a, a psychological phenomenon that happens with people. We probably could also say sociological phenomenon, where something that's originally valued as a means <clears throat> becomes an end in itself inappropriately. Um, so like money, not valuable for its own sake, only valuable for what we can do with it, but because there's so much attention on it as having its value as a means, we may start just obsessing about it for its own sake. We might just start valuing it and confusing it as being something intrinsically valuable when it's not. Um, yeah. Oh man, there's so many tangents that I go on. I'm not, but I, I think, I think that's good for now. Um, unless there's anything else from chat. Um, so what's uh, what's Tuska's problem with idealism? Why why is he skeptical about this? Um, he, he's so skeptical that he's like, we shouldn't be doing this. This, this the, you should you should not be an idealist about loyalty ever. I mean he's he's comes down pretty strong on it. And like I said, personally I'm I'm a little skeptical of that stance. But um, but what is his concern? And I and I think I even in disagreeing with him um, in his ultimate conclusion here. I do agree with him about the concerns. So his, his, the general concern is that this form of loyalty is just really scary and dangerous. So um, I did I say here in my lecture notes that this part is a little ambiguous in the reading, but, but this is the big things that I was able to get out. Um, the, the, the thing that I think Dusk is most concerned with is how if you're loyal to an idea or an ideal or an ideology, that really, um, it's really easy to forget about people and people morally mattering. That the idea ends up superseding that moral importance, um, a kind of moral insensitivity to what happens with people. And I connect this with, I mean, I've been teaching for a while now, and I always, every quarter, especially in, in, when discussions of morality and ethics and religion come up, I always have many, many students who have expressed to me a deep skepticism of ideology. And I think the story kind of goes like the way Duska tells it. Um, we've had a lot of ideologies in our history. And when you look at the historical record of humanity, it doesn't go very well. Like there's so many cases where an ideal that otherwise might look pretty okay um, when people commit to it and devote themselves to it, i.e. have loyalty toward it, that it just goes sideways so often. So it's sort of like, whoa, touch this very carefully, like the don't play with fire kind of thing, right? And and I I have seen people who, many people, who uh, kind of take Deska's stance on it and are like, yeah, don't bother with that. Like, I'm not, they, they might even say to me directly, I'm not ideological. I don't have an ideology. Now, personally, I'm not sure if that could even be true. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little skeptical that you could just opt out of ideology entirely, as if you have no abstract ideals that you have a commitment to whatsoever. Part of my, my skepticism about to throw another argument into the mix here is that if you want to care about people, you still need to be able to flesh out what care for them looks like. And that's going to mean having some set of, like, a vision of an idea of how people ought to ideally live individually and together, um, the meaning of life, all that kind of stuff. Um, ideology doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be. This is something we talked about a lot this afternoon. To be committed to an ideology doesn't mean you have to become uncritical about it, or that you're never willing to question it, or something like that. <clears throat> when we're talking about devotion to a cause. It doesn't have to be 
mindless uh, commitment, right, or uncritical commitment. It could be a very informed choice that then you also continually reevaluate. Like, do I want to stay committed to this? Does this deserve my loyalty? And if you're like, yep, still deserves it, then I'm like going to keep doing it. Right? So it doesn't have to be like you turn off your brain and you're like, I obey this ideology, right? This kind of brainwashing thing. Now, does brainwashing happen with ideology? Oh, yeah, definitely that happens. But I, that's why I'm kind of concerned that um, Duska's arguments here might be straw manish in that he describes something that can happen with ideologies, but that shouldn't happen with ideologies, especially by their own standards. So <clears throat> all, especially all this stuff about like, um, where is this? Uh, the examples he uses where the vehicles are mistaken for the meaning, like say a form of government is like just automatically something you have to be loyal to for its own sake uncritically, kind of think <clears throat> people's attitudes about capitalism or democracy in the Cold War uh, time, where just like anything that smacked of socialism was evil and you just stay away from it. I mean, that's a confusion of... Um, an idea with a particular thing. Or the other example that um, <clears throat> Duska uses about um, the that quote uh, from about uh, the Sabbath, right? That the, the Sabbath is made for man, not man made for the Sabbath's sake, right? Like the ideology ultimately, maybe the ones that are deserving of our loyalty, ultimately are saying there's something important and valuable and meaningful about people. And uh, like justice is important for the sake of people and if those uh, ideals that we pursue uh, end up not being about those things then like what is it we're actually being loyal to I mean that's not what idealism is really saying you ought to be doing so if it gets twisted up to become something that it isn't and that thing is bad I don't think that's necessarily telling about what the value of the original thing is um, a lot of things have the potential to be abused or, or distorted that are still you can't fairly evaluate them based on their distorted versions but really the the authentic thing but I have a pretty good example of how this distortion can happen um, in the lecture notes here I have this thing about my friend sketch comedy group so um, I, I won't I'll, I'll make sure this tangent doesn't go too long but it's a good illustration of I think it captures a lot of what Duska's concerns are against idealism and then we can move on um, so my um, my college years were spent not hanging out with a bunch of philosophy majors, but actually hanging out with a bunch of goofball theater majors and lit majors and stuff like that. And a bunch of my friends had this uh, sketch comedy group that they were in. And it was called Ubiquitous They. And they did it through college, and then when they all graduated and moved to Seattle, uh, they kept it going for quite a long time, for many years after, after graduation. Um, so I wasn't involved with it. I wasn't an actor, a writer, or anything like that, but I knew everybody, and they jokingly referred to me as the board, um, like I was the board of directors for, for the organization, even though I did jack shit for them, other than to be friends with them. And so I was very connected with it, and and the, the those friend, that group of friends with this sketch comedy group, they had an idealistic commitment to Ubiquitous They, that was the name of the thing. Um, they had ambitions. It wasn't just like screwball comedy for fun. It was like they, they wanted to make art, comedic art. So they held themselves to very, very high standards, to these visions of artistic ambition. Um, it kind of reminded me of, uh, I don't know if anyone watches it anymore, but Monty Python's Flying Circus. I mean, it might look like absurdist screwball comedy, but it is very carefully crafted and very intelligent at times. Um, actually, I don't know if you know this, but uh, many of the Monty Python people are have philosophy degrees, actually. And it kind of shows in their writing, even when they're doing totally absurd stuff. So, so my group of friends were doing that. And so many times, they were so consumed with that concern about that artistic ambition that they would just abuse each other. They would forget about how they're friends, and they care about each other. And they're doing this because it's meaningful to do it with others. But they, they kind of got distracted by the, that artistic ambition to this ideal vision of what ubiquitous they was, that they had loyalty and devotion to that. And so I got involved a lot by like playing diplomat and smoothing over disagreements and mediation and stuff like that, and reminding them about what they're really all about. That that is a thing that they are committed to, 
but they're also committed to other things too, including people. Um, and that's going to go very much in the direction that Duska wants this conversation to go. Okay, um, so I think that's probably pretty good here for um, for getting at um, the idealism thing. Um, yeah, I like this like metaphor about um, fetishizing moral rules. There, the replacing the spirit of the law with the letter of the law. That's a really good example. Um, and Duska goes for the low-hanging fruit here with things like religious and political wars, ideological conflict, things like that. But I really do think, especially picking out these ones, um, this can happen if you just care about anything. If you find anything meaningful. Um, I, I told a student earlier today in our class that I don't know how you, like the, going back to my skepticism about how someone's not ideological, if you have beliefs at all, what does it mean to hold those beliefs unless they translate into action somehow? You, you have to have some kind of commitment to them. If you're like, I value this, I think this is good, and then you never do anything about it. You never contribute to it. It doesn't inform your actions in any meaningful way. Then it's really hard to see how you authentically hold that belief or value. And to be committed to um, having that value happen seems to me pretty intrinsically connected with just having the value. So um, that's going to probably be a danger, like these kinds of dangers, the conflicts of disagreements about that, um, are always available if we care about stuff, that we have sincere commitments to values and meanings, um, and they don't sync up, that they're in conflict. There's always going to be the danger. I don't m mean that war is inevitable or something like that, because we have other ways of dealing with our disagreements without killing each other. Like the code of intellectual conduct, I think is a pretty good model for things like that. Um, but um, but the the danger is still there. The danger is still there, and probably I would argue unavoidable. But regardless of what we think about this idealism thing, um, like I said, I don't think this is going to affect Duska's arguments too much. Um, but we've ha we've got these two other models here. We've got this social atomism idea and the moderate view. And social atomism is going on really the complete opposite end of the spectrum from idealism. Idealism is loyalty to an abstract object, an idea, a cause, a purpose, a vision. Social atomism is concrete. Loyalty to people. That's what you have loyalty to. Um, my phone's blowing up. Ugh. Okay. Um, I actually want to do some more drawing here. So, and, and really, um, I, I don't want to overstate uh, Duska's rejection of social atomism, because his, his complaint about it is not really that it's wrong so much as it's incomplete. So let's talk about what loyalty in the context of human relationships could look like. So you might have, um, here's you, you know, and you're going to be loyal to another person. So here's the picture. Here, I should pull this up. There we go, bigger picture. There we go. So here's a person loyal to another person. And what social atomism is saying is that really all discussion of loyalty is reducible to the normal moral obligations that you have toward others. So like being loyal to a person is like respecting their human rights and fulfilling your promises, like being trustworthy. Um, not doing them harm, they, you know, things like that. That's a, that's how you should understand loyalty. It's just you have to be talking about specific people and the obligations that you have toward them, and uh, and this could be reciprocal or not or whatever, right? Um, but it, it's all it's reducing loyalty to just moral obligations to particular people. Deska doesn't like this, um, not because it's wrong, but because he thinks it's incomplete. It's not getting the full picture here. What it's ignoring is a way in which there's another reality here. There's a reality of this third thing that's between these two people. And I like to call this the relation, relational space. Or, in more informal terms, just the relationship, <laughs> when we talk about relationships. Um, so, there's uh, Duska is saying with the moderate view, take social atomism, add on top of that 
this notion of an abstract object, not a person, but an, an abstract third thing that's independent of the two people, but which the two people both contribute to. Okay, So um, I, I'm going to use a lot of metaphors here from um, relationships. So like families, loving partners, things like that. Um, and actually, in fact, like romantic partners are, are probably one of the best here because, especially for the way Dusk is going to go with this. Um, but when, you ha when you're in like a romantic, like a committed relationship with another person, you're like, there's what's going on with you, there's what's going on with them, and there's ways in which those like have causal effects on each other, like that person makes me feel happy, or like um, that our, uh, we're able to coordinate on this activity well, we, we have like compatible styles or something like that, preference, satisfaction, all that kind of stuff. Um, they make me laugh, you know, stuff like that. But the, the Duska would say, that's not really what's defining of the relationship. And the way in which your two causal properties bounce off of each other in this causal nexus, that's not really it. And yeah, you've got obligations to each other, like, here's me and I'm like, what do I need to do with respect to you? And it's sort of a private thing to me about how I fulfill my obligations to you. But a relationship is a lot more than that, Deska says. He says it's, like, it's something you're building with the other person. And you both make contributions to. And you might be fine, and they might be fine, and the relationship could be crap. Or you might be doing bad, they might be doing bad, but the relationship is doing really well. Right? Those things can happen. The relationship itself is its own independent reality that emerges when people are in relationship with each other. And it's a kind of thing to invest in. It's a kind of thing that could be doing better or worse. And understanding how the relationship is doing is not reducible to just what's happening with the two people taken independently. That's the really key idea here for the moderate position. What Duska wants to add to the basic core of social atomism. It's the, what's interesting here is that Duska is saying you can be you can treat as a proper object of loyalty the relationship, right? This third thing between the two people that can be a proper object of loyalty, even though it's abstract, like idealism, right? But it's not like idealism in the sense that it's an abstract entity that only exists in the context of people. And that's why the moderate view isn't going to run into the trouble that Deska was putting, heaping on the shoulders of the idealism model that's saying it's easy for people to get lost in the shuffle here. Well, in a relationship, it's not that. I mean, it's right in front of your face that the, 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 the relationship itself it has to do with people. And what's happening with the other person conditions that. It colors that space. Now, I had some students kind of asking a bunch of tangential questions this afternoon about, like, what defines this space? What, what's going on with it? Duska doesn't give us a ton here. He gives us a little bit. I've got some speculations about where I'd go with it because, like I said, relational spaces is a big part of my ethical picture that I've been working on for myself. But um, Duska leaves us with this. He says um, the relationship... The character of it um, is defined by the purpose that the two people have that they're working toward together, a kind of cooperative purpose of the relationship. That's going to color what kind of relationship you've got. Now, I, I think there's some other details here that could very reasonably be added to that, like maybe you've heard this word institutional memory before. Um, well, there's a kind of institutional memory that happens in your relationships with people. If someone, maybe someone's treating you nice right now, but if, you know, last week they blew up at you and said a bunch of nasty things, like, you remember that, right? That has now changed the nature of the relationship that that thing happened, that there was that tension that threatened the relationship. And then if you overcame that, right, where it was like, oh, yeah, we, we've kind of, treated each other wrong but we've gone through that space of like forgiveness and a, and a reinvesting in each other and saying like yeah I don't want that to be a deal breaker I want to I want to work past that and then that work happens now that builds a different space and character to that relationship too um, but those are all going to be purposeful things right they're all going to be in the basic model desk is offering about um, whether what are the sort of shared purposes that we're working on together so much of a relationship is two people meeting each other where they're at. And that can be a way of um, having shared purpose, too. Even if that purpose is just mutual understanding or mutual compassion or something like that and nothing more. 
Um, so Duska is going to say the way that you can understand like what you're loyal to could be that relational space. And whether that relationship is something that is a proper object of loyalty depends on what's happening in the space. So what Duska is, is going to focus on are kind of the conditions of what kinds of purposes that define a relationship could qualify that relationship for being a proper object of loyalty. Okay, so those are the those are the really big ideas here from this early section. Um, getting to Duska defending the moderate view. This is going to be the setup for everything that comes afterward. Chat, how are we doing? Anything I can help with? That was kind of getting to a big stopping point of sorts, a big culmination to that big idea about the moderate view. It's going all right? Good? Mm -hmm. any, any, any reactions? Any, um, anything you're curious about with this? Anything you're skeptical about? Anything you'd, you'd want an answer for from Duska about this? Just so far? Looks like maybe no. Okay. Um, this might be a good time for a break. Um, and then we can pick it up uh, um, the, the second half of the Duska argument here about, okay, now that we understand what sense of loyalty we're talking about, what are the conditions for something being a proper object of loyalty, and do businesses qualify? Duska, in, in the way he structured his paper, like I had this nice clean outline for his argument that I gave you at the top of the lecture. Duska doesn't execute on that quite as organized as I presented it. He kind of dives straight to being like, well, here's what's happening in business, and that looks like not good enough to me. <laughs> but we can try to piece it together and see, like, what are the conditions he's trying to be sensitive to here. Larmer, I think, incidentally, misunderstands Duska in a couple places. And then when I look at it, I'm like, that might be a little bit of Duska's own fault. Like, he could have been a little bit more direct or organized in how he set out his... Um, perspective on loyalty here, but we can we can do a lot charitably here to reconstruct it for him. Um, but he's going to kind of do those two premises side by side. What are the conditions for something to be a proper object of loyalty, and can businesses meet them? He's going to kind of tackle both simultaneously in the paper. Okay, but let's take a let's take a short break here, and we'll come back and do that, and then we'll do Larmer. All right, so now let's uh, let's take a look here at what Duska has to say about businesses and what a proper object of loyalty would have to look like. Um, so going into um, my lecture notes here, um, I've got the section titled Duska's Final Position Slash Arguments. So he's he's going to be running this. Um, oh, sorry, let's do this. Uh, he's going to be running this moderate view. And he's saying to be to being loyal to a group, which you can like, um, it doesn't just have to be like in my model here between two people that they have this like relationship space right here. That could be a group of people, like we talk about a family, right? And, uh, I don't know about your family, but in my family, I've got relationships with the individual family members, but the entire family has this kind of thing happening that is different in character, it's more than the sum of its parts, right? It's more than just the sum of the individual relationships I have with my individual family members. There's there's the shared thing of like what we're doing. And so there's nothing about a business in definition uh, just like a collaborative, cooperative organization that makes it disqualify as a proper object of loyalty if the moderate view is the way that we're looking at objects of loyalty, right? But Duska says to be loyal to a group in a way that goes beyond or above the mere individuals in that group would require some foundation of loyalty that comes from 
the the way in which that relational space gets defined. So I, I love his phrase of this, the ties that bind, right? What's going on in that relational space between people or in the middle of a group? Um, whatever the character of that is, is the thing that we have to evaluate to figure out whether you could be loyal to that thing, that abstract collection of people, the, the, the relational way in which all the individual people are bound together in a common purpose of some kind. So the purpose of the group really defines those ties that bind, the bonds. Um, I've got that highlighted in my lecture notes because of how central that idea is to, for Deska. Um, but when we look at businesses, um, they the purpose of the business is to make profit. Not always and not always exclusively and that's part of the whole debate about fiduciary duty and whether social responsibilities can be a part of things or not but if we're taking how things usually end up going most businesses are cooperative enterprises for the purpose of profit and not for something like mutual fulfillment and support as Duska puts it um, like in the way our other kinds of relationships like family relationships or partnerships or parent-child relationships could be defined um, that they could have that going on with them. So that's part of the problem here for Duska. Um, to, to skip ahead a little bit, there isn't a space here in which there's going to be a kind of going above and beyond just my basic moral obligations or duties to people or institutions that allows for this extra devotion or um, investment in the good of the other, right? The the fulfillment of that other thing existing in a good state. Um, so if you're going to be loyal to your company that you work for, it's like you have this personal investment that you choose to devote to the that company being successful that is caring about it for its own sake. And the fact that there isn't a reciprocal relationship on the part of the company is a kind of a deal breaker for Duska. So if we did want to start defining some like theoretical conditions here for Deska about what kinds of relationships are proper objects of loyalty, he thinks there has to be some kind of, ha or at least it would be a sufficient condition to have um, there be some kind of mutual investment. Otherwise, we might say this is misplaced loyalty. And and take for example like just a friendship. Say you're friends with a person, and you're invested in them and they don't do anything to be invested in you. And it's not saying things have to be exactly quid pro quo or something like that. That wouldn't really be loyalty, right? It wouldn't be like, it, it, loyalty Duska describes in places is like, it's going to entail things like self-sacrifice for the sake of the other, um, that extra investment. And um, businesses just don't do that for their employees. That doesn't happen. Um, even though they might ask for that of their employees, like to work extra hours, to to uh, take on responsibilities that are outside their job description, or to be like paying attention and looking for opportunities to make a difference in the overall company's operation. I mean, those are the kinds of extra above and beyond sorts of things that would be connected with employee loyalty. Um, but that's not what happens on the side of the company. The company operates in a mercenary fashion. As soon as the employee is no longer helping their profit maximizing, or they could maximize profits by firing the employee, replacing them with someone else, then they do it. They do it. Unless doing so, like as a matter of policy, might cut into their ability to attract better employees and thus take a cut to their profits. I mean, that kind of thing, right? Even if the company is concerned about what's happening with its employees, it's still ultimately, most of the time, for the purpose of maximizing profits. There isn't an, an there isn't a commitment to the good of the employee for their own sake, but it's always derivative of the success of, so the success of the business. So two people can operate cooperatively with each other in, say, like a startup enterprise or something like that, without having any kind of loyalty bond between them. And that's what Dusk is really seeing happening in the business world. Um, he says business functions on enlightened self-interest, um, and in the so as soon as it makes more is favorable for one party or the other to break the relationship, they do it. The same thing happens sometimes for employees. They're like, if I get a better job offer someplace else, I'm going to ditch this company and go there. 
And that's just how the business world operates. And if that is the what is happening, then Dusk is saying that, that that kind of relationship doesn't give you the basis for loyalty. That just doesn't pass muster. Because there isn't this commitment in the intrinsic value of the other entity, um, much less in a reciprocated sort of way. Um, now, one, one kind of, uh, I think Dusk is trying to head off a potential objection here when he talks about um, how you can't buy loyalty, right? So, uh, it was, you know, someone could say, well, of course the company is interested in the good of the employees. They give the compensation, <laughs> right? Um, but Dusk is like, that's not, that's not good enough. Um, that doesn't necessarily involve any sacrifice on the part of the business, um, especially if this is connected with offering compensation that's like what they can get away with in the market in order to maximize their own profits. Um, there's a, there's another, uh, well, okay, I'm going to hold off on that idea for a second. So on this point about how there's not the reciprocation, Dusk is basically concerned about employees that think that they ought to be loyal to their company when the company doesn't respect that at all, like ultimately. That they're they're basically the the notion of employee loyalty just sets up people to be doormats, to like in that friendship with the person who's always like abusing your goodwill and doesn't reciprocate or have any acknowledgement of it, right? If they're unable to reciprocate, that's something different, right? Um, but if they can and they don't, then that changes the character of the relationship, and at a certain part, it becomes codependent. It could become abusive. And then that's not a relationship that Duska thinks you ought to have loyalty to. That wouldn't be appropriate. Um, you're just making yourself into a, do a doormat. So he says, like, um, to believe that there is some kind of bond of loyalty in the business world is a kind of foolish romanticism that sets people up for disappointment and potentially harm, that they're not ultimately going to be able to uh, have their best interests met um, when they're sacrificing for the company. So I mentioned earlier that um, I had uh, I've had a lot of friends working in different, especially tech industry jobs, where this seems to be really rampant, um, where the company is sort of there's there's a culture of expectation that the employees need to be like going above and beyond to promote the interests of the company and in it, and its success, and if you're not doing it, you're not on the team, right? You're not you're not doing you're not being a good employee. And really, Duska is setting up something different. He's saying, so like this next point in my lecture notes, um, that all to say all this doesn't mean that we don't have duties and responsibilities to the company. Duska's fine with that. He's like, you make an agreement to do a job, you need to do your job. But it doesn't mean you have to be loyal to the company. You, you're just operating under a contract. You're like, the company is like, we want to hire you for this job. And you're like, what's the job description? That, okay, what are you offering me for compensation? Yeah, I'll take that deal. I'm willing to take your money to do this job for you. But nothing more, right? Duska says, I really, this quote I think is really important for, for Duska's position here. Duska holds that we sell our labor, but not ourselves to the company. And that's also connected to why you can't buy loyalty here. Now, um, I, a student brought up in my afternoon class this idea of like, um, what about, um, or I don't know if a student, brought, maybe I brought it up, but it came up in conversation. Um, what about this situation like um, a uh, assistant, you know, like a, someone hires a, a um, office assistant or something like that. And I, I've, had a, I've actually had a couple friends do this job for like rich people in the city of Seattle. And they're basically on call. They have a very open-ended job. Like the their employer basically is like, Hey, I want this right now, and they're like expected to do it. it. Doesn't matter what time of day it is, all that kind of stuff, except for specially set aside days that they're on vacation, you know, that kind of thing. But I mean, the job description there is really open ended, and D Dusk is not necessarily concerned with that. I mean, he's like, if that's the expectation for the job, if that's what you you agreed to sign up for that for compensation, then that's fine, and then you do have to do those things. Right? But what you're selling there, you're selling something defined. You're like, here's the labor that I'm going to offer, and here's the price for it, and there you go. But to go and do anything more than that, 
um, to go above and beyond that, to have this devotion and commitment to the success of the business, Vesca's like, no, no. Your responsibilities as an employee don't extend to that kind of logical space. And they, and if you think that they do, you're wrong about it. <laughs> That's basically his position. Now, I, I mentioned here that Duska at the end kind of leaves open. Uh, he puts a, he leaves the door open. He cracks the door open here for a business being potentially a proper object of loyalty. And and I can see it too. Like, um, let's say the company really does. Um, in a sincere way, value its employees for their own sake. Like imagine you've got managers who are stakeholder theorists, who are like, you know, it's not just about the bottom line and maximizing profits. We have to run this business in a way that is concerned about the interests of everyone who's affected for their own sake, including the employees. Working for a company like that, you might have loyalty to that company. If you know that the way that that company is operated is really invested in what is intrinsically good for you regardless of whether it helps the company or not um, it's hard to tell sometimes because even companies like say Google is a really good example of this Google has like you know their branches and stuff maybe you've seen pictures or or visited or know people who work in like their San Francisco branch for example I mean they've got all these perks to the job you know they're like setting up the um, the company as kind of like a little village and in some ways, that, that doesn't bother me too much. I'm like, if businesses saw themselves as stewards of a slice of the economy that makes a space for people to have livelihood, and that that's one of their bottom lines, is the well-being of people in society, then, you know, that could that could be a company that that is deserving of loyalty. There's that reciprocated concern. But it's just so fuzzy, because so many times those tactics um, are ways of just... A, attracting better employees or and this is a really insidious one um, like trying to promote productivity so if you like living in the village of the company on their campus for instance you'll be there more often doing more work more involved more invested in the company this kind of thing and that might be something that increases profits so it might be a big strategy right now it's certainly possible that both things could happen it might be that the company actually being directly committed to the good of its employees in a way that isn't focused around the bottom line may end up having a kind of profit maximizing effect in the long run um, that could that could maybe have that effect but it'd be, it'd be kind of going back to Kant here about like what's the reason why it's done so for for example in our relationships with other human beings that in relationships that we think there is proper loyalty, that they are proper objects of loyalty, chances are um, that's going to be a better way to live. You know, like having a healthy relationship with another human being is just good for you and for them. To be invested in the good of somebody else is a way that you can have a better life. I, I honestly and sincerely believe that is true. Um, that a better like from like an Aristotelian perspective like what's the what's the good life what's an example of life at its very best I think it involves that as a component but that might not be the reason why you do it it's not like oh I'm altruistically concerned about other people because I want this good life for myself or something right so it'll have to come down to the intentions and the big intention here that I think would be defining of loyalty if we're reading between the lines for Duska is this commitment of the good of the another for their own sake that's the really really key idea Okay, now I promised that there was going to be a little other thing here at the very end for Duska um, that I wanted to get to, and that he kind of goes on this tangent about teams, right, the, the sports metaphor for the business world, um, and he says company loyalty can sometimes be disguised behind team loyalty, in other words, loyalty to one, one's fellow coworkers like in this context of, like, we're all working on this team together to be successful, so we need you to, like, be a part of the team, right? And and to identify with it and to see your good in the good of the cooperative community, right? The the enterprise of the company. Um, by the way, um, loyalty uh, can very much, this is another tangent came up in my other class, I, I forgot about it and then I, I re really remembered it just now. You know, one way in which loyalty is a very relevant moral concept is that whatever you have loyalty to 
ends up really shaping and conditioning your own sense of your own identity. And that is, identities are very meaningful objects. And don't get me, I, I'm getting myself started on this, but there's a lot that could be said about that. Um, and I think uh, part of another way we could put Duska's claim here is that he thinks it's dangerous um, and not respectful. Maybe you, you might put it this way it's not respectful to yourself to find your identity in your devotion to a company that doesn't give a shit about you. Or to, I mean, I know this is a, a really loaded example, but I, I do think that it's an apt comparison of what's happening in principle here in Duska's mind. Imagine um, uh, domestic violence, domestic abuse. That happens in the context of relationships. And one of the tragic things about this is oftentimes victims of abuse do see themselves as having, as like loving and caring for their abuser. That they have some loyalty to them, that they need to stay in that relationship rather than leave it. Um, and then their identity gets wrapped up in it too. So much so that another one of the things that I'm familiar with in, in my own research on the phenomenon is that a lot of uh, abuse victims have a very difficult time understanding themselves after they escape from the abusive relationship. Not always, but the, the, this is a thing. It's like comes up a lot in, in say, like um, post-traumatic trauma and the therapy around it and stuff like that. That like the the things that we find that we put our loyalty into end up shaping our conception of ourselves and that that could be for better or for worse like that might be you might actually be loyal to an object of loyalty you might have that commitment to it because it you see that the way in which that loyalty affects your identity is an accurate representation of who you are like for example um a really basic example of this would be um Kant's moral theory. I mean, he doesn't just have these principles, these moral laws, but there's a conception of what you are as a person, like where you get your dignity from in the fact that you have the capacity to be self-determining, to subject yourself to the categorical imperative, all that kind of stuff. Like that, that and, it, and I've actually met some people who have become convinced of Kantian ethics, not on the grounds that these values are like the objectively right moral values. They didn't start there, but um, but because Kant's way of understanding the human situation or what way of understanding what kinds of things we are, it seems to be accurate. That 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 that's an apt description of of what it is to be a human in this life, and then the rest of the morality kind of falls off from that. So that kind of thing can happen, and and this is related to the team thing because. Very often I, I identify with the team. I find my identity in my participation in that team. And like Duska says, this isn't always bad. Like he's like, sports are great. You know, I'm just playing a game and it's like competitive, but it's it's just a game. And there aren't really a ton of consequences about this. And we're not talking about professional sports, right? We're just talking about like intramural or something. Like play a game with some people and it's fun. Like I play all these board games and or where's there's my closet right there, board games. Um, and it's not like we're trying to destroy each other, but this is the wrong framing of understanding the meaning of what's happening in business relationships, according to Deska. In in the real world of business, there are winners and losers, but people's lives hang in the balance. It's not as simple as like the kind of trash talking that you see in a casual pickup game on the basketball court in the local park, right? It's a little different when you take that framework of operating and a way of understanding our relationships and apply it when people's livelihood hangs in the balance, right? Um, so uh, Duska, I think, has this whole section in the paper because he's worried about how these meaningful models, like a team, end up conferring a kind of legitimacy on how we understand our roles and our relationships in the business world that is inappropriate. It's like the way in which we can see a proper object of loyalty in this one space then gets bled over into another space. And particularly this idea about how, where he says, um, the company loyalty is disguised behind the loyalty that you might have to your fellow coworkers. So, so Walter brought up um, a, a, po a question about this over the break. And this was the kind of thing I, I wanted to address that I was alluding to at the beginning of the lecture. Um, I've had some friends work at Microsoft, 
and I don't know if any of you have any experience working at Microsoft, but there's something really sneaky and slimy that Microsoft does, in my, in my opinion. I think this is, it's clever, but it's nasty. Um, Microsoft, in its corporate hierarchy, intentionally sets up positions of competition between its own employees. And, and there are prudential reasons for this, like there's, um, it's trying to uh, increase productivity and efficiency by using competition. It's like cl classic um, uh, capitalist theory, um, economic theory. Um, and uh, it, the, what, what they do, it, it's not just a matter of competition, but it's exploiting people's uh, social relationships. That it puts people on a team where their own success depends on each other. And that builds, it, with those kinds of coworkers that you're seeing every day, um, that you're engaged with all the time, we're human beings. We naturally want to have these ideal relationships with each other, the kinds of relationships that can be proper objects of loyalty. So Microsoft sets up these situations. It's almost like social engineering, where people are pushed. There's a momentum for them to associate with each other and, and make these ties that bind that then they work harder at the job out of not wanting to disappoint their coworkers, right? To honor and be loyal to them, to be invested in the success for their own sake of these other people, something super idealistic. And what happens in the background? Microsoft makes more money, more productivity, right? And, and that's, that's a case of loyalty to people that then can bleed over into a kind of de facto, and maybe even the employees feel this way about it, a kind of loyalty to the employer too. Now, I definitely have met some people working at Microsoft who like, they got woke to this when they worked there long enough and they're like, these guys are assholes, right? <laughs> they're like manipulating all of us to, um, to like, uh, it's like a, a big, um, uh, like alien zoo kind of thing, right? Where they take some humans and then like, Try to make them have these relationships. It actually, the pilot episode of Star Trek. Big fan of Star Trek. Um, the pilot episode of Star Trek is all about that kind of scenario, about aliens abducting humans and then trying to make them have a relationship with each other in a, this like artificial environment. Um, but they're trying to make it happen naturally, and then you know. Anyway, I don't need to talk about Star Trek. But Microsoft kind of does this sort of thing, um, and that's really tricky. Um, there's a temptation, I think, where, let's go back to whistleblowing. You know, this whole thing is ultimately about whistleblowing. Let's go back to a case of whistleblowing. Someone might be in a position to blow the whistle, and yet they might hesitate on it. Not because they're confused about what's right and wrong about what the company is doing, but because they might take responsibility for harming their friends that work at that company. Like, if you care about the people that you work with, which is not a bad thing, you know? Like, you live lives with people um, to have positive relationships that involve things like deep loyalty. That's a good thing. That's something that makes life better. Um, but this is something that could be potentially exploited or could end up working in the favor of the company in a way that's very illegitimate, like in a whistleblowing sort of case. Someone might hesitate to blow the whistle on the company because if the company fails then all their friends are going to suffer the consequences of it. And there are many cases where people have resentment. Employees of the company that's doing wrong resent the whistleblower because how it affected them. Right? They don't put the blame on the people at the company that fucked up, that did immoral things and made them exposed to it. They put the blame on the whistleblower that made it all public that then brought the accountability down on the company, which I think is misplaced. That's misplaced blame, but it's also connected maybe with some misplaced loyalty. Um, the relationships that you have with your coworkers, you could maybe be loyal. They, those could be proper objects of loyalty. But I think Duska is right to kind of warn us about how we can drift from that into loyalty to the company. And ultimately, Duska's whole plan here is, and I can turn my hat back for this, right? Companies are not proper objects of loyalty, so there really shouldn't be anything blocking you if you think the conditions are appropriate for blowing the whistle. There shouldn't be any resistance to this. The whistleblower should not feel guilty about blowing the whistle. They shouldn't feel bad about 
um, betraying the trust of the company because the company doesn't deserve this. Like that's not um, a part. That's not something that conditions the relationship. So, Walter, I wanted to see if uh, me talking about that theme kind of addressed the question that you had, um, or or maybe there's some stuff left over there too. It's a messy situation. While, while you're still typing, um, thinking about this theme, I, I think Dusk is right that there we can cleave a logical difference between loyalty to certain people in the company and loyalty to the company itself. Um, and so I, I think those can be, you, you can imagine how one can happen without the other. But it becomes very, very difficult to separate them in practice. And I think companies often know this, like Microsoft, and exploit it. And to me, that's even that's kind of worse, right? It's taking something that is, uh, to use some very ethical theory language here, something that's intrinsically valuable, or so I would argue, like meaningful, deep, committed relationships that we have to each other in whatever capacity those things happen, um, are are valuable. They add meaning to life. They're one of the I I would argue is one of the core values. I mentioned relational spaces are very important to my own ethics. Um, but to twist them up and use them as just another mechanism for profit maximizing seems really bad. <laughs> I mean, the things that seem the most morally worse to me um, are thing are when you take something that's really good and twist it up into something really not good. I mean, those those are the things that kind of get my goat the most. Rather than just like blatant wrongdoing, it's like doing wrong in the name of good or being able to accomplish evil through something intrinsically valuable. that Those are the things that are just really disturbing to me. Um, okay, it feels good for you, Walter. Okay, awesome. We still have Larmer to talk about. So um, let's get into that. I think that's a lot of coverage of Duska um, and maybe more than maybe, maybe more than you needed, but um, let's do Larmer. Larmer won't take too long. Um, there's, there's, it's a pretty simple setup here for Larmer. His paper's a little shorter too. Um, Larmer is responding directly to Deska, but not just to Deska. Larmer is basically fighting a two-front war um, on this whistleblowing issue and employee loyalty. On the one hand, he thinks businesses can be proper objects of loyalty, so he disagrees with Deska's pessimism about this. Um, like I said, I, I think there's maybe some ways in which they're not directly in conflict. There's, and and ways in which I think um, Larmer in some cases misunderstands Duska, um, but there are a couple particular points that they definitely don't see eye to eye on. Specifically, the asymmetry versus the symmetry, the symmetry of of proper loyal relationships, um, or proper re relationships that can be proper objects of loyalty. Um, but there, there. I mean, like I said, Duska leaves the door open that maybe if a company operated in a different way, if the nature, character of their relationship with their employees was on a different foundation, that there were different ties that bind other than just mutual benefit, like I need a paycheck and you need some labor kind of thing, let's cut a deal, um, then maybe they could be proper objects of loyalty. I think, I think Duska is open to that possibility. He's just so pessimistic that it any actual conditions in the world meet this. Um, and even nonprofits, I mean, it's not just for profit companies. I, like I said, I could go off on nonprofits for a while. I love them. I think they're very important. And I think they have a lot of cultural issues that are very similar to cultural issues that happen in profit companies, too, especially taking advantage of their employees because they know that their employees are in it for a higher purpose and not just the paycheck, blah, 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 blah. Same thing happens at BC, too. I'm an adjunct faculty. Anyone who knows stuff going on at Bellevue College can probably guess where I'm alluding to. But um, like, I don't think BC is necessarily invested in me for my own intrinsic value, that kind of thing. Um, I think there's a lot of exploitive stuff happening. But anyway, um, 
Larmer is going to disagree with Duska's conditions for whether the business can be a proper object of loyalty. So there is some disagreement there. So that's on one side. On the other side, though, Larmer disagrees with the standard model, too. Uh, and again, the standard model being this framing of the concern around whistleblowing that it's a violation of loyalty. And this is where the most interesting things from Larmer come up, in, in, in my opinion. I mean, the things, the really big things he has to say are not as much about Duska as much as about the, um, what loyalty means. And that's what the second half of his paper is all about. He's basically going to argue for the claim that whistleblowing is not a betrayal of loyalty. It's actually something in line with loyalty. So he's thinking his sort of final position is that business can be proper objects of loyalty and we should understand whistleblowing as an expression of loyalty rather than something that goes against it. And his arguments here are very interesting. So let, let's take a look at that. So uh, in terms of this argument against Duska, the main issue is about the reciprocity. So the, uh, Larmer uses this example about the loyalty of a parent to a child, um, where he says, like, uh, imagine um, a parent, you know, is supposed to, we think it is appropriate for them to have loyalty to their children, even when their children don't show any loyalty to them whatsoever. Like some, you know, rebellious late teenager who's like, Fuck you, parents. I don't care about you. You can go to hell, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, even if the child is not showing any degree of investment in their parents' well-being for their own sake or something like that, uh, that doesn't mean it's wrong for the parents to be invested in the child. And I think he's right about that, I mean, as far as it goes. Um, the question is, if that counterexample to Duska's condition opens up the space for a company being a proper object of loyalty. And I'll throw my little two cents in on this one. I, Larmer, I think, has a more burden of proof to shoulder here than he actually does. His argument is incomplete at this point. All he's left open is the like logical possibility of asymmetrical relationships that are proper objects of loyalty. That's it. Um, if you apply it to the business context, I think you get a little wacky result. And I, so I think if Larmer, if if Larmer is going to shoulder his burden of proof, he's going to have to deal with a potential way in which his the proposal as it stands right now, if applied to business, is absurd. And let me f f flesh that out. Uh, so let's use the parent analogy. I don't think this is going to be able to work straightforwardly, but maybe Larmer wants to make it more complicated. But if we were taking that analogy of the parent being loyal to the child that's like rebelling against them and doesn't care about them, what would that mean for the roles of the employee-employer relationship? It would mean that the employee is actually in the parent's role, and the rebellious child who's like, fuck you, parents, is actually the business. So the business is not reciprocating the kind of investment, the over and beyond thing that the employee is giving. Which should, I mean, if that doesn't immediately strike you as a little wacky, um, this might help to illustrate the wackiness. You know, in the parent-child relationship, the parent has a lot of the power. And the child is growing and getting more power and independence and that kind of thing. Um, but they're also, just in terms of self-empowerment, you know, a person's still maturing. They're still figuring out how to be a person, right? And so, you know, the even if the parents didn't have other kinds of power, like owning the car or the house or whatever it is, they would still be more empowered in terms of their maturity and things like that. So it makes sense to expect of them to be the bigger person in that situation, right? But in the case of the employer and the employee, it's the employer who really has all the power. And we might want to say the responsibility, but under Duska's arrangement, it's like the, the employees have to do this kind of paternalistic uh, caring for the corporation which just can't help being a profit maximizing machine that can't give a shit about you or something like that and that that seems false uh, it seems weird to have the relationships of responsibility be disconnected with the power relationship and it just seems false to me that the company can't help but be a profit maximizer that doesn't care about its employees for their own sake that doesn't seem to be necessitated um, Uh, I, I will get to that in a second, Walter. Um, so uh, this is this is Larmer's um, argument about um, challenging Duska's requirement on reciprocity. 
Um, so, uh, shoot, there's something else I was going to say. Mm. Oh, oh, right, right, right. So, throughout the all of Larmer's paper, he's responding directly to Deska. And I don't think that Larmer kind of has the final word on this. And if we had a little bit more time here, I might try to flesh out more of where the dialogue could go. But you can think about this for yourself, too. I think you could probably, in my lecture notes, I have uh, these, like, um, suggestive setups for for how um, we might continue, like, any way for Deska to respond? You know, how could this go? Any ideas why Deska doesn't do this thing or that thing? I mean, there's definitely ways in which you can extend the, this uh, conversation and debate further, and I'd encourage you to if you find it interesting. It might even be something for a paper topic or journal entry or things like that. Um, Walter you said here, uh, I attended a job workshop where a lady went through a Microsoft layoff she had been there for years, and it was surreal, movie scene-like, to listen and experience her expression of feeling lost and unsure of herself. She expressed being loyal for so long that it had become her life, yep, the identity connection, and now had to rediscover herself, mm-hmm, and who she really was, so she came back to BC to do that. Yeah, that that's part of why I have a lot of sympathy for Deska here, and why I feel like this tactic on the part of Microsoft is just unconscionable is that it leaves a wake of destruction. It, it chews people up and spits them out. And it, it's not just a ignoring of what is good for people for their own sake, but it positively can damage them too. So that's, that's some of my moral baggage about this kind of behavior. Um, it's not just business stupid or something like that. I mean, there, there are concerns here, and they can be respected by businesses, and if they are negligent about that, that seems unjustifiable to me or so I would argue. Okay, so um, Duska also goes on, or uh, D uh, Larmer goes against Duska in another way too here, um, talking about loyalty to fellow employees or to stockholders. Duska does mention the loyalty to fellow employees and I think there's definitely more to that conversation. We've explored some of that here um, in, in the discussion tonight. Um, but also, Duska never mentions shareholders, and this might be interesting. Um, I, I mean, I think Larmer's doing a little bit of like, gotcha, Duska, like you didn't talk about this, so you got to talk about that. But I'm like, does he? <laughs> uh, personally, I'm like, I think I can guess what Duska's going to say. He's going to say the relationship between stockholders and employees does not create a space of ties that bind that would also qualify as a loyalty relationship. I mean, it, it just doesn't. But again, like I've been warning, the fiduciary duty debate is lurking in the background everywhere. So I think Duska would probably be partial to someone like Boatwright, who's saying, look, there isn't any interaction. There isn't any substance here for how they relate to each other that would allow for there to be a relationship that you could be loyal to that could meet the conditions for proper loyalty. Um, but if you got someone like Friedman or Hasnas, who's thinking like, Oh no, maybe it makes sense to understand this as like being like an implicit or an, a quasi contract, right? Where the employees um, return loyalty as part of an exchange of honoring how they're being given a job by the employer. But this starts to strain credulity, I think. Um, and at least for everything else Duska says, it's not going to fit for him. Um, so I think we can extend those arguments pretty easily. Um, I also think it's worth pointing out Larmer does saddle Duska with the claim that loyalty is only appropriate between moral agents, and I don't think that he holds this. I think that's to reduce him to a social atomist position when he's explicitly doing the moderate thing. Like, Duska doesn't have an in-principle problem with loyalty to institutions, like co cooperative communities. That's totally possible. Um, yeah, so, uh, and then... Um, yeah, this this last argument that um, Larmer brings up is is actually a place where I see a connection between Duska and Larmer. Like Larmer's thinking this is an argument against Duska, but like I said, I think Duska does leave the door open here for how companies could maybe meet these standards of that would be required for proper loyalty. Um, in which case, that would be okay then. But here's the really interesting part. This is the part I'm excited to get to here, and then we'll we'll finish off our lecture here. We're coming up on an hour and fifty minutes, so <clears throat> getting close to the home stretch here. Let's finish it off. The, the way in which Larmer is trying to argue, not against Duska now, but against the standard view that sees whistleblowing as a disloyal act, he's saying, no, it isn't. Um, Larmer's like, the whistleblower is not faced with a moral tragedy. 
of choosing the lesser of two evils. Um, either I betray the company and violate loyalty and I take on this, I, I don't act in this virtuous way that I'm supposed to, or I neglect these concerns about wrongdoing or possibility of harm, risk of harm, stuff like that. Um, Larmer's like, no, there isn't that kind of dilemma. So in some ways, Larmer and Duska are on the same page that there isn't any anything that problematizes whistleblowing that w would be whistleblowers need to wring their hands about and stay up at night being like, oh, no, I blow the whistle. Is this wrong? Kind of thing. They should still be thinking about, like, are the things that they be blowing the whistle on accurate? Is it serious wrongdoing? Those things still make sense. But there isn't some other kind of prima facie duty that gets in the way of being concerned with these other moral values that the whistleblowing would be motivated by. So um, here's the key argument that Larmer offers for why we can make sense of whistleblowers as being loyal. Oh, I, uh, by the way, before I do this, um, sorry, I have another thought that's important here. Um, there's some initial plausibility to Larmer's view uh, in terms of like intuitions here that I think are relevant to talk about. So let's go back to Snowden again. Again, I don't want to kind of, I'm not intending to comment on what's the ultimate right way to uh, va evaluate whether what Snowden did was ultimately right or wrong. But at least in terms of Snowden's understanding of himself, he thinks he's being loyal to the country, to America, to American values and things like that. And he also thinks he's being loyal to the government, but not the government as it actually is, but as it ought to be. So he thinks he's a patriot, right? Um, how could he think that if he's going against what the government wants, which is definitely true in Snowden's case. It's so much so that they want to extradite him in order to put him on trial and put him in jail. Right? They're, they're, the government is very clearly uh, opposed to what Snowden did and wants to hold him accountable for it because they think that it's wrong. Right? Um, so Snowden clearly did something that went against what the U.S. government thought it it, its interests were. But Snowden's saying, no, that's wrong. Right? He thinks he's actually being um, responsive to the interests of the United States government. How could that be? Larmer gives a very plausible story for why. Okay? But if we think that that can happen, and, and like Larmer quote, uh, quotes or references in his paper, most whistleblowers don't think of themselves as disloyal. A lot of times whistleblowers are like the best employees too, the ones that are like principled, responsible, um, thoughtful, uh, that kind of thing. That they're not they're not just mercenaries, right? They're um, they see a, a relationship here to be honored, and it leads them to blowing the whistle. So how would we cash out that intuition though? What what would be the moral substance that's backing it up that gives it weight? Here's where Larmer's argument goes in. So. He also is going to be critical of an assumption about what it is to be loyal. Um, and the thing that he disagrees with is an idea that a lot of people have running around in their heads, he thinks, that to be loyal to someone is to act in a way that accords with what that person believes to be in their best interests. And Larmer thinks that's wrong. To be loyal to a person is, does not mean doing what that person wants. To be loyal to the company is not to do what that company thinks is in its best interests. Okay, so he uses this example of like, I'm not disloyal to my friend for refusing to loan them money for a purpose I believe to be disastrous, like a bad investment or something. He's like, even if my friend is pissed off at me and thinks from their perspective that I'm being disloyal to them, that I'm not being a friend, I am still truly being a friend. I am being loyal to them because I'm concerned about what's actually best for them. It just may not accord with what that person thinks is in their best interests. Now, there, one thing that's important to clarify about this, because Larmer's move here is actually not completely uncommon. Um, it actually kind of accords in some ways with Aristotle's de definition of friendship, um, with other definitions I've seen about how to understand what care is or what it is to love a person. It fits very neatly with how we understand things like parents loving their children and other examples like that. But one thing that has to be clarified about this, um, switching it from what the person believes to be good for them to what is actually good for them, um, there's a big concern here that maybe in making that move, 
someone could be tempted into thinking, oh, I don't need to take into account what that person thinks about their own self-interest. And that's not the case. I don't think Larmer is committed to something like that. Um, and there's a lot of good additional reasons why we might think that what a person thinks is in their best interest is definitely a very important factor in judging what is actually in their best interest. For one thing, they know themselves a lot better than someone external to them does. Now, that's not always the case on a, any particular thing. Sometimes an outside perspective, someone else can see you better than you can see yourself. Um, but uh, in many ways, people have a kind of privileged access to their own life that other people don't see as directly as they do, don't perceive it as directly. Um, so that could be a factor. And in, in, in as much as what's good for a person can depend on um, what's happening in their inner experience, that would be re very relevant information. So like when I, I, I kind of have a view very similar to Larmer's in, in my ethics where I uh, needed to give a definition of care and I've got one that has this kind of dimension to it. And I always say, I'm like, if I'm going to love or care about somebody, um, I really want to listen to their voice. For one thing, being having their voice listened to and respected is a part of the good for them. That's like Kantian autonomy and dignity, right? To respect that. But also, um, just like we saw with Kant, we can be wrong about that, but how would we know? And a person talking to a person and understanding what they believe to be good for themselves can, even if they're wrong about it, provide pretty important information about figuring that out. In the same, For the same reason that talk therapy is a good thing, right? That like when a, a person goes to a therapist and talks about what's going on with them, there could be a lot of bullshit going on. But in getting it all out there, in having the therapist listen to what that person thinks about themselves, that can give a roadmap for understanding like how best to care about them or what would really truly be good for them. Um, but respect for people is really central to what is actually good for them, I think, and one of the best things that we can give to each other as caring people. Um, so that all this emphasis on how people might be wrong about what's in their interests is, uh, is not to over to override these other kinds of concerns about respecting people, if that's making sense. Um, I'm noticing that chat had something maybe? No, okay. Any Chat, how are we doing on that idea? There's a slight tangent, but I think an important one. We're doing so far so good on Larmer? Cool. Okay. Thank you for the feedback, Leticia. I always appreciate that. I'm not just talking into a box. Okay. Um, oh. Cool. Awesome. Thank you, Theo. Um, so uh, the next big step of the argument. So the the first step of Larmer's argument is just to to debunk this idea that um, loyalty to a person or to a thing means acting in what that person or thing's belief is in their best interest. It's to act in what's actually in their best interest. Second big idea that Larmer has here that's going to be working toward an argument for why whistleblowing is not disloyal is that acting moral immorally is never in someone's best interests. And that's another really big and interesting idea from Larmer. That immoral actions can never actually be putting someone in a good state. And I think, I, I say in my lecture notes here, I think this is the major claim that Larmer's case really rests on. I mean, even the first premise is kind of an interesting one, but when you think about it, you're like, yeah, yo, no, that makes sense. There's lots of counterexamples here of, like, being loyal to a person in a way that frustrates what they want or what they believe is good for them. That, that you know, that's a little easier to swallow. But this is a part that might be more controversial because a lot of times when we do immoral actions, we think it is in our best interest to do immoral things, right? It seems like crime does pay sometimes, right? Like, I can get this thing that's good for me um, if I can get away with, you know, not the negative consequences of accountability for my illegal or immoral actions. Um, but Larmer is saying a person's, what I called moral status, remember what the, the status of a person being guilty or innocent of some ro possible wrongdoing, the moral status is built into whether a person is in a good state or not. 
And I think there are some uh, intuitions I can appeal to here, or scenarios that, that would back up Larmer, uh, Larmer's claim about this. Um, in particular, I think about the context of uh, parents um, caring about their children. So parents don't want their children to be immoral people. They, don't, they want them to have virtue. They want them to respect moral values. They think that's better, that that's a good thing, that these moral values are not just some like external hoop-jumping expectations of whatever, right? But that the moral values have intrinsic value, that they deserve to be followed, and it'd be worse if that didn't happen. That if someone is living in a moral way, in a just way, in a compassionate way, they're in a good state. There's a kind of moral health. And if someone is doing immoral actions, there's something wrong. They're morally sick and need some help, that they're in trouble, right? Um, they're not existing in the state that is an ideal human state to exist in. Um, so this claim is so important for Larmer's thing about whistleblowing because basically if there's something that is happening in the business that is deserving of whistleblowing, that's a sign that the company is not in a good state. And it couldn't be in the company's interest ever to go along with that wrongdoing or to be complicit in it, to use Davis's language. Um, if you think not blowing the whistle is actually being loyal to the company, Dusk is like, or I'm sorry, Larmer is like, you're just wrong. You're just flat wrong in thinking that way. That it's never in the company's interest to do immoral things and to be illegitimate. If we're using, uh, maybe think back to the um, social contract theory of, of business ethics in the fiduciary duty debate, we're saying like the legitimacy of the corporation depends on uh, it fulfilling this justice requirement that the company is not violating considerations of justice or human rights or stuff like that and this well-being requirement that it's actually serving in the interest of people in society that it's benefiting society to exist if the company is operating in a way that violates one of those terms according to social contract theory the business has now become illegitimate it doesn't deserve to exist and what the social contract theory tells managers is that their duty their fiduciary duty is to the company in the sense that the manager has to protect the operation of the company to make sure it's legitimate, that it stays legitimate. Okay? So if the company is engaged in wrongdoing, it's in danger of being illegitimate. There's something wrong with the company. Something bad is happening here. Whistleblowing could be the remedy. That's Larmer's idea. Okay? So uh, whistleblowing... Like, I'll just read this here. It can be a way of expressing loyalty in as much as whistleblowing helps to prevent the company from engaging in future wrongdoing or to make corrections that are dysfunctional, unjust, you know, policies or procedures or aspects of the institution that are, are morally problematic. The whistleblowing calls attention to that, maybe can inspire change about it. Um, and again, Larmer throws in this stuff about using internal means first because the concern is about, like, making this thing uh, as good as possible with, you know, without harming it in other respects. I think a, a really strong analogy for this would be like a parent that finds out that their child shoplifted. Um, you could imagine a parent kind of taking the Larmer angle on this and being like, that's bad behavior, we'll, we'll deal with this in-house, right? Like literally in the household. Um, talk to the child about it, talk about how serious that is don't do this thing, encourage them to change, blah, blah, blah. But you can also imagine a parent, maybe, maybe they do it right away, maybe they do it later, um, but you can imagine a parent who's like, calls the cops on their own kid. It's like, there's accountability. They blow the whistle on their own child kind of thing, right? And I've had some students react before and they're like, man, that sounds like a bad parent. But there's certain cases in which I think you might have, even if you're sort of skeptical about that as being good parenting, there might be certain cases in which you're like, no, that is the right call to action. Maybe not for shoplifting or something, but imagine something much more serious. Um, I'm maybe mm, so. I have a kid now. I'm trying to think of a scenario. <clears throat> Let's say what one that I'd have that intuition for. Mm, mm. Okay, this would this is, and it's actually very timely for stuff that was happening on BC today. Um, although I, I'm not sure about the details. I shouldn't have said that. But anyway, let's say um, my child, uh, I find out. No one else knows about this. It's not public. 
But I find out that my child, Luke, I'll use his name to make this more real. I find out Luke is has been putting up um, hate messages in bathrooms and posters and threatening people in this anonymous way uh, that is prejudicial at the school. First, I would probably feel like I'm a failure as a parent. But the second thing would be like, I can't just keep this to myself. That's not caring for my child. They need to meet with accountability for something that serious. That's a real problem. Um, so I would inform the school about it. So I would I would blow the whistle on them. I, I think that maybe you disagree with me about whether that circumstance would qualify, but that that's one that I can honestly say, yeah, that would be that would have crossed the line for me. That's the kind of thing that Larmer is imagining for the whistleblower. That if they can deal with it in house, then maybe the situation calls for that. Maybe you use those procedures first. But there is definitely a line that gets crossed where it's like the best way for me to care about the company is by going public with this, even though that's going to mean other complications, other bad things. Like if I turn my kid into the school, is that going to make things bad for them? Yeah, it's going to really complicate stuff for them. They might get kicked out of school. All right? That would complicate a lot of other things in their life too. But that might be the right thing to do. It might ultimately be the most caring thing. So my child might not feel that way about it. Luke might not feel that way. He'd be like, I was betrayed by my father. And it might still be the right thing to do. And I might have to live with that. And and hope that they can understand that maybe not now, but maybe later. It would be a very tragic thing. But this stuff happens. I have heard personal stories. I'm, I tried to come up with one for myself so I'm not telling other people's personal stories. But I, I have ones that I know of where this actually happened. Um, okay, so uh, loyalty to Larmer requires care. And he's like, I can easily see how whistleblowing is caring. So it, it's, not, it's not that the whistleblower just wants punishment for the company, that they deserve to be punished for their wrongdoing. But really, in Larmer's view, it's a de and maybe through the punishment, there's a desire to restore the company, which would otherwise be legitimate, into a state of legitimacy. Through either changes or, I mean, I, and to a certain extent, I think just participating in systems of accountability, like punishment, can accomplish that. The same way that, like, um, if, uh, I, actually, this is a really, really good uh, analogy for how that could happen. Let's say we're, we're friends and I do something and betray you. And it's, it's serious, but I know our relationship is solid, and I know you're a, a, a very charitable, loving, compassionate person, and you care about me. So I'm like, we all know what happened, but maybe we don't need to talk about it. And we can just move forward as friends. And, I'm, and I privately, I'm like, yeah, I fucked up. I'm not going to do that again. But we don't talk about it. And I'm sort of taking for granted that, you know, you're going to still care about me and we're still going to be friends. It's still a, a wound, uh, and it's still something that attaches to my moral status that I did something wrong and also maybe I learned my lesson but I'm also not acknowledging it and if I apologize I'm putting myself into a state of accountability with you that means something I mean apologies are not just like hey you cool okay right but it's something like I'm I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to relate to you in this way that it, where I'm acknowledging the wrongness of what I did and by talking to you about it and doing something difficult like that and and respecting your autonomy to be like, "Will you forgive me?" You can you get to say yes or no. That's a way in which I can express my investment in doing what's good and to try to restore that relationship and to restore myself to a state of moral right doing instead of moral wrong doing. And Larmer is saying this is what whistleblowers do with their companies. That even just putting them under accountability here can be a way of trying to restore the company to moral legitimacy. So that's that's Larmer. So we're at two hours and, and eight minutes. Um, I'm feeling pretty good about our treatment of Dusk and Larmer tonight. I think it's been robust. I, I don't feel like I skipped over a lot of stuff here. And we got to explore a lot of little tangents along the way. I do think that this material is wonderful, not just for understanding business issues but also relationships in general um, so maybe you've uh, gotten something good out of it that way too but before we sign off here tonight 
let me um, let me give you a code word before I forget. I'm getting better at remembering. And tonight is going to be rose. Uh, rose is the code word for tonight. I always have something on the table here. It's useful. And also, I want to check in with chat and see if there's any kind of hanging threads you have uh, from our conversation tonight. Any questions you have, any things you want to explore further here, uh, please let me know. Maybe I'll, I'll pause the video so it doesn't just have minutes and minutes of silence here and see if anything pops up. Okay, it seems like there's no other hanging threads to talk about. But um, as always, to all of you out there watching this on YouTube later, uh, I will keep advertising it over and over again, but I always love talking with students um, outside of class, and you're always welcome to call me. I've had a couple more chats with people this week and, and um, very much enjoying that. The paper is going to be coming up. Um, we should start thinking about that soon. I'm going to have a bunch of information for you about that. Um, stay tuned to the weekend update email. Um, but if you have any glimmers of ideas about paper topics, I encourage you to talk to me sooner rather than later and definitely um, clear a topic with me. Um, I can give a lot of advice about whether something's going to work for this for this paper assignment for this class or not and maybe how to attack it or how to research it or how to explore it, develop it, all that kind of good stuff. And I'm when it comes to the paper in this class, I might have said this in the first week, I'm interested and being as involved with your process of writing it as you're willing to let me be. <laughs> um, I think there's some, not to like toot my own horn or anything, but I, I can be a resource that can help with that, I think, a lot. Especially if, if writing something like a philosophy paper is maybe something you've never even been asked to do before. This, this kind of assignment, this kind of paper might be something uh, absolutely new that doesn't uncommonly happen in this class. So uh, let me know how I can help you with that and be a support to you. Um, I'm always always willing to. Um, you're always welcome. Okay, have a good weekend everyone. Uh, weekend update email coming soon and we'll talk about affirmative action next week. Very exciting. Okay, see ya.